Hello and welcome to today's webinar on preserving your family treasures. My name is Geneva Morse, Director of Education and Online Programs here at New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be moderating today's event. NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history. Today's webinar was made possible by our annual fund, and we are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Giving today's presentation is Todd Pattison, conservator here at NEHGS. Todd works to preserve and care for the Society's collection of books, manuscripts, and fine art. He comes to NEHGS with more than 25 years of experience from the Northeast Document Conservation Center and has also worked as collections conservator at the Harvard College Library. Todd is an active member of the New England chapter of the Guild of Book Workers, a fellow in the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works, and for the past five years has taught the course American Publishers Book Bindings 1800 to 1900 for the Rare Book School at the University of Virginia. He has an undergraduate degree in art history from Nazareth College and an MLS from the University of Alabama. So surely many of you joining us today have books, photographs, Bibles, letters, and other paper or fabric-based objects relating to your families, some of which can be quite old and fragile. This webinar seeks to provide you with best practices for preserving your family's heritage. Todd will begin by explaining the difference between preservation and conservation, our focus today of course being on preservation. He will then describe uh, some of the basic um, or some of the material and environmental causes for deterioration and how best to prevent future damage by reviewing best storage and enclosure methods. He will also discuss best practices when handling family artifacts and provide some tips on digitization and reformatting. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question in the panel to the right of your screen. We'll address those after the presentation. There is no handout for this session, but we are recording this event and starting tomorrow you can easily go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website. So if you miss something on today's first listen, don't worry, you can always go back, uh, rewind, fast forward, pause uh, the presentation and watch it over and over again. All right, so with all of that out, out of the way, I will now turn things over to Todd. Thank you, Ginevra. I'm really excited to talk about preserving your family treasures. It's a large subject for one hour, so I'll be presenting a lot of information in a short time period. The first thing that I want to do is address the difference between preservation and conservation. They're often used interchangeably as if they represent the same thing. And while there is a strong connection between them, there is an important distinction in the definition of these words. Preservation is the umbrella term that conservation fits under. It is the big picture of caring for your personal possessions and encompasses many different activities from keeping paper-based materials out of direct light to carefully handling objects when you use them. Preservation activities are ones that affect your entire collection and you will get the greatest return for time and money spent by focusing on those activities first. Preservation is also an essential function if you are the custodian of family treasures. Now, preservation is not a new concept. People have been preserving materials for centuries. Shown here is a canvas overcover that was put on a leather-bound volume around 1840 to protect it. A damaged part of the overcover has been lifted back so you can see the good condition of the leather underneath even as the overcover has worn and faded due to handling and light exposure. Now, people often think of preservation in connection with large cultural repositories like New England Historic Genealogical Society, but your personal possessions deserve the same attention, and most materials in institutional collections were at one time owned by individuals. Your family treasures form an important part of our collective cultural heritage. 
Now, the one encompassing goal of preservation is to protect cultural materials from loss of information, either written, physical, or contextual. If we change objects, they tell us less about the time period in which they were produced or used. Instead of being a small part of the larger goal, conservation tends to be what most people think of when it comes to preserving their family treasures, fixing something that is broken or has a visible problem. Conservation activities may include dry cleaning old letters, humidifying and flattening a photograph, or even an extensive treatment of a scrapbook. These are the things that you do to an object, likely changing it in some way. You should really work on the larger issues of preservation before considering conservation treatment, as it is best to keep your materials from having condition issues in the first place, or at least prevent them from becoming larger issues. The ounce of prevention versus the pound of cure strategy. All right, let's talk briefly about the nature of the materials that are in your family collections and what causes them to break down. The more you understand these two issues, the better custodians you will be for your family treasures. Paper-based materials like letters, manuscripts, ephemera, and bound volumes might be the most common things in your family collections, but you may also have photographs, old quilts, clothing or other textiles, and objects like ceramics. Almost all of these materials are organic in nature and will deteriorate over time. We can slow this deterioration down, but for their long-term preservation, a lot depends on how these items were originally made and how we store them. For instance, the group of manuscript letters shown here are written on poor quality paper but the tears and small losses would probably not have happened if the letters had been stored flat. Paper is made of cellulose, which is a repeating chain of glucose fibers, and it's derived from plant cell walls. Historically, the fibers used for paper were typically linen, cotton, or hemp that came from rags, either used clothing or other discarded textiles. The mid-18th century paper on the right was produced using long paper fibers, giving it strength and flexibility even after 250 years since it was originally manufactured. This is a handmade sheet of paper. I'm showing it using transmitted light so you can see the chain lines and the watermark. Brittle paper is most often found with 19th or early 20th century materials which many of us have in our personal collections. The quality of paper decreased during this time period for two reasons. The use of wood pulp, which led to shorter paper fibers, and increased acidity in paper from the materials used in the manufacturing process. Acid can also be introduced into paper from air pollution, including the burning of fossil fuels. These acids within the paper cut the glucose chains into ever shorter lengths over time until they have no strength at all. These are the two characteristics that we look at with paper. Durability, paper gets its strength from the length of the fibers. The longer they are, the stronger the paper will be when it is first produced. And then we also look at permanence, chemical stability over time. How long will it last before it will become brittle on its own? Both of these are considered internal factors that affect the preservation of paper. Now these internal factors are common to most materials. Their durability and the initial permanence are determined at the time of manufacture. We can't change internal factors in our objects. But there are also external factors that will affect the preservation of your family treasures, and they can be changed and improved. In most cases, these external factors are very similar for all your items. If you improve them, you're benefiting all of your collection materials, no matter what they are made of. <clears throat> these are the major consideration when it comes to your environment. The first three, temperature, relative humidity, and light, 
are fairly easy to understand, but we have to realize that environmental factors work together. If you have a problem with one part of your environment, it is likely causing problems with other parts as well. For example, too much sunlight coming into a space can raise the temperature. Higher temperatures can then change the relative humidity. So where we might normally think of light only in terms of fading collections, it can also intensify other factors damaging your materials. Pests, like insects and rodents, can do direct damage to your collections by eating them or long-term damage by adding dirt, staining, and other pollutants. Air pollution can enter your space from the outside, but it can also come from within collection spaces with fireplaces, wood stoves, or heating and cooling systems. The last factor listed here, acid migration, can be difficult to see as the damage it causes happens at such a slow pace and often out of sight. We think of paper being acidic, but other materials can be as well. The portrait on the right is printed with acidic ink, while the ghost image you see on the left is the damage to a blank sheet of paper from the acid, basically burning the paper slowly. The longer it is in contact with the portrait, the darker the stain will become. If you have acidic collections, you can take some steps to mitigate this damage. In this case, a thin sheet of acid-free buffered paper inserted between the two pages will slow the acid migration. But really the biggest concern with acid migration is normally with the materials used to store your collections, in particular, poor quality folders and boxes. Most older textiles are made from natural fibers like linen or cotton and have the same problems of breaking fibers and damage from folding as paper. But textiles tend to be more susceptible to light damage than paper, especially colored textiles. And the dyes that were used to get this color, particularly browns, greens, and reds, can be acidic and cause harm, eating, the way, eating away the fabric as can be seen here on this signature quilt. The brown areas of the pattern fabric have deteriorated to the point of loss, making handling or use problematic. Many of your collections will have photographs, which typically consist of a light sensitive layer on a substrate of paper. But your collection may also have photographs that have substrates of glass, metal, textiles, or even plastic. Photographs are particularly susceptible to surface wear, especially when the light sensitive layer is thin and not well protected. The daguerreotype on the left is an example of a cased image. It has a copper substrate and a thin silver photo layer that is particularly easy to damage. The silver should never be cleaned or even touched. The case has glass that protects the image. So if you have cased images with missing glass, getting replace, replacement glass inserted by a qualified conservator should be a priority. Some paper-based photographs have multiple layers that expand and contract differently from the paper substrate, causing them to pull or roll as seen in the image on the right. Now there are photographic processes like color photographs and certain film bases like the acetate negative shown here that have internal factors that make them deteriorate quite quickly. They will break down under even the best home storage conditions. So current recommendations are to place them in cold storage to halt deterioration, much the same way you might freeze food to preserve it longer. This is best done by an outside vendor. Don't just put them in your home freezer. And given the wide range of photographic materials and manufacturing processes used to produce them, if you have important photographs that are at risk, you may want to consult a photo conservator. So let's discuss the proper storage environment you were looking for with your collections, and then we'll look at protective enclosures, which play a strong role in protecting materials when they are not being used or displayed. The environmental factor that conservators talk about most is temperature, 
as heat catalyzes or speeds up chemical reactions that cause deterioration. Lower temperatures can greatly extend the life of your materials. Some studies suggest that if you lower the temperature by 18 degrees, you will double the life of your collections. But temperature needs to be stable, as swings can cause dimensional changes in collections that accelerate deterioration, quickly harming materials like parchment, as with the indenture shown here. So it's really important to know where your collections are stored. Do you have family treasures in an attic, a basement, or a garage? Does your storage space have HVAC systems? And by that, we mean heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems. Temperature and humidity are often considered together, as relative humidity is a ratio expressed as a percentage and refers to the amount of water vapor in a specific amount of air compared to how much total water could be held at that temperature. Change the temperature and you will often change the relative humidity. Paper, leather, parchment, textiles, they're all hydroscopic, readily absorbing and releasing moisture. So you wanna maintain a stable humidity in the range of 30 to 50%. Low humidity can dry out materials, leading to cockling paper, flaking ink, and cracked emulsion on photographs while high humidity can catalyze chemical reactions, it promotes pests, and it can damage metal objects, as in this tin-type photograph. As the metal plate rusts, the collodion image layer begins to flake off. So it's extremely important to not store collections in attics or garages, and particularly not basements, which will almost always have high humidity. And really the biggest issue with higher levels of moisture in the air is mold, which can occur in as little as 48 hours of high humidity conditions. Mold spores are everywhere and can become active with increased moisture. Mold is also quite dangerous to people and can in some cases pose a major health hazard, especially for anyone with respiratory problems. This means mold remediation is best left to trained professionals. And if you do have mold in your collection, treating it is not the only thing you need to do. You must also find the reason why there was a mold outbreak in the first place, so you can take steps to make sure it won't occur again. Mold is often caused by water, and it is important to remember that accidents can happen to your family treasures. You can take steps to minimize this by keeping food and liquids away from your collections at all times, and be careful not to store materials near water sources. And if you do have a disaster situation, don't panic. Make sure that people are safe first, and then secure buildings. Do not go into wet areas if there might be electricity present. Beyond safety concerns, you usually have more time than you think, so take a little bit of time to gather information and make a plan. If you need extra time, you can always freeze wet or moldy materials, putting them in a state of suspension while you figure out your next steps. And there are also resources to help you. I've listed the Federal Emergency Management Agency as they have information about the salvage of family treasures. And here are two 24-hour preservation disaster response hotlines. If you have an emergency list somewhere of police, fire, local government services, etc., you might want to consider including these numbers. It is always nice to have a professional to talk to if something happens to your collections. And below are three recovery service providers if you do have a disaster. This is not meant as an endorsement of these providers. You should evaluate them for qualifications and make sure that they fit your needs. For collection storage environments, conservators tend to recommend temperatures and humidities that are ideal for people, since collections are often in the same areas as living spaces. Again, stable temperatures around 70 degrees and from between 30 and 50% relative humidity. 
Having your collections in an area that you frequent makes it easier to notice changes or problems quickly. You should keep your materials in the dark whenever possible to prevent fading, yellowing, and other light damage. Ultraviolet or UV light is the most damaging to your collections. So if you have to display materials in lighted spaces, you want to particularly make sure to minimize UV. You can put curtains or shades on windows, and there is special glass or plexiglass that screens UV and can be used on frame objects, as with this 19th century sampler. Controlling air quality is challenging, and it's not always considered when it comes to the preservation of collections. This dusty air vent should remind you to make sure that any heating or cooling vents are cleaned, filters are changed frequently, and furnaces and air conditioners are working properly. Electrostatic precipitators, or so-called air purifiers, should not be used because they produce ozone, which can damage collections. Keeping collection areas clean is also very important to prevent insects and other pests. They are often attracted to food debris and tend to like dusty areas. Regular cleaning will also facilitate the inspection of collection areas to make sure that pests are not a problem or help catch an infestation quickly if one occurs. When looking at storage furniture, ideally you would want to choose powder-coated steel as this will not off-gas harmful chemicals that can damage collections. Realistically, since your family treasures are likely in your home, you'll have storage areas and furniture that is already present and may predominantly be wood. Wood is acidic, so you have to worry about acid migration and wood can off-gas chemicals that are harmful to collections. Even the paints, stains, and varnishes used inside homes can off-gas chemicals such as formaldehyde. So if you're painting or staining wood or other surfaces, you should use low volatile organic compound or low VOC paints or polyurethanes. This is not only better for your collections, but also for your own health. Make sure to choose furniture or spaces that are appropriate in size for the collections to be stored and provide good support for materials. Oversized shelving may be required for some objects so that they do not project into traffic pattern areas where they can get bumped and damaged. And specialized furniture may be required to store maps, posters, architectural drawings, and other oversized materials. Proper storage is greatly aided by protective enclosures. As they can minimize light and dust damage, they can buffer them from contact with acidic materials like wood, and they can generally protect fragile materials. So it's critical to consider the quality of the enclosure materials you use. You don't want to use standard cardboard or any other poor quality material. There are very high quality commercially available storage enclosures for the storage of flat paper, such as letters or ephemera. And placing documents in folders and in a storage box will help to organize them, label them, will minimize handling, it provides added protection for fragile items, and allows for safer transportation from storage areas to workspaces. The enclosure pictured here would be considered full. You don't want so many items in a box that they are wedged in or prevent your fingers from grasping a folder. You also don't want the enclosure to be only partially filled as then the folders can slump. They make boxes of various widths and sizes. And there's a general limit of 10 items per folder suggested for housing your objects, but very fragile or important items you may want to folder individually. Now, just because something is labeled as archival is not a guarantee of quality. It is a kind of a catch-all term that has no standards or manufacturing specifications. Almost anything can be called archival. You want to concentrate on terminology that does have specific requirements, like acid-free, 
means that the material has to have a pH of seven, of at least seven. Anything below that is considered acidic. Lignin is an organic polymer that adds rigidity to plants. So lignin allows trees to grow tall, but it contains carboxylic acid, which deteriorates cellulose. It also darkens when exposed to light, which is why old newspapers tend to be brown. Many collection materials benefit from being in contact with buffered paper, which means it has an extra ingredient like calcium carbonate that raises the pH slightly and makes buffered paper aggressively stand up to acid migration. Microchamber paper, which has zeolites or molecular sieves, can trap and hold the acids and odors reduce, reduced, released from your collection materials. You can place microchamber paper in storage enclosures or in direct contact with paper items. I've included some suppliers for storage and protective enclosure materials along with websites. This should not be considered as an endorsement, but I have used materials from all of them myself at one time or another. You'll need to look closely at the specifications of individual storage materials to make sure that they meet the requirements for your collection needs. Many vendors also sell specialized enclosures for non-paper-based objects. These should be constructed for the size and weight of the item, such as this 19th century doll. This object is fragile and three-dimensional so a loose packing of acid-free buffered paper has been placed around the doll to help hold its shape and make sure that it is not damaged by sliding around inside the box. The textile parts of the doll can also be safely cleaned before storing using a fine screen and low suction from a vacuum. The screen will make sure there's no pulling to the textile, although fragile textiles and those with painting, embroidery yarns, or beads should not be vacuumed. Oversized textiles may need to be folded, which is the case with the signature quilt that we looked at earlier. Refold textile items at a different place each time you take them out of an enclosure to minimize folding damage to any one spot. Sharp folds will cause the most damage, so it is best to add padding at the folds using strips of unwashed, of washed unbleached muslin or other clean white textiles. Especially fragile items can be rolled around large tubes to prevent folding at all. Just make sure the tube is made of high quality, acid-free material or line it with acid-free buffered paper before rolling your textile, wrapping more paper around the outside and placing the tube in an enclosure if possible. Paper enclosures are often the best choice for photographs as they protect from light, they breathe to prevent the accumulation of harmful gases, stiffer paper can prevent curling or rolling, and it is easy to write on paper to keep track of the image inside. Choose photo enclosure materials that have passed the photograph activity test. There are two components to this PAT test, one to detect image fading, and one to detect staining reactions between enclosures and photos. Plastic enclosures of suitable quality can also be used with photographs, and they're actually preferred for cyanotypes or blueprints that are acidic by nature and may be harmed by prolonged contact with buffered materials. Just make sure to use uncoated polyester, polypropylene, or polyethylene that does not contain plasticizers or other additives. You should not use polyvinyl chloride. Glassine enclosures are also not recommended as glassine is made from short groundwood pulp fibers and can contain additives that become acidic over time. You should consider boxing fragile items, but also objects that are in good condition as a prevention. The most important thing for a box is that it fit correctly. If objects can move around, they can get damaged. The enclosure shown here is called a phase box and is typically the least expensive box that is individually measured to fit objects. It is constructed from a single piece of material that is folded, cut, and glued at the corners. There are commercially available phase boxes, 
But if you have the training, space, raw material, and hand skills, it is possible to make your own. Boxes also allow you to label items without attaching the label directly to the object. Although objects are not always square, your enclosures will be, so you need to carefully measure books and other three-dimensional objects. There are commercial devices for measuring, as seen on the left, but you can also measure accurately using a ruler and right angles. The important thing is to measure the widest or longest square part of the object and have your enclosure constructed from these exact measurements. A higher quality alternative to a phase box is the cloth covered drop spine box. These are more expensive to purchase, but the look of the enclosure can send an important message about the value you place on the object. People are more likely to carefully handle a book when that book came from a more expensive box. It's just human nature. Cloth covered drop spine boxes are heavier and slightly stronger than phase boxes and are usually constructed by book binders or book conservators. This is not something easy to make on your own without specialized knowledge, tools, and materials. This is a good time to transition to handling since we just spoke about how people may handle objects more carefully if they see how much value you place on them. There are three basic elements to handling material carefully. The first is to make sure that you personally are ready to handle an item. You want to have clean, dry hands. Don't use any creams or lotions that can get on objects. Tuck in loose clothing or jewelry, pull back your hair. If you're going to handle a family treasure, you don't want anything that can catch or damage that material, or even distract yourself from proper handling. Also be prepared for an object that may have some weight or is fragile and needs special attention when handling. I just wanted to reinforce this idea of clean hands when handling objects. Hand disinfectant cannot take the place of hand washing with soap and water. You also don't need to wear gloves with historic documents or books. Clean, dry hands are perfectly fine. But for sensitive photographs and certain other materials like metals, gloves can help protect from any slight amounts of oil that your hands have naturally. Cotton gloves are no longer recommended, as they are not form-fitting and cut down on the tactile senses in your fingers. Instead, you should, you should use nitrile or latex gloves if you have to use gloves, and they should be discarded after use. The second step is to prepare your space. It doesn't matter if you are working in a reading room, an office desk, or on your dining room table. You need to have a large, flat space that's clean and empty. It's important to know where you will place objects before picking them up. Don't hold the item with one hand while clearing space with another. And make sure there's a clear path between where you store collections and where you use them. Open any doors, remove anything that's going to be in your way. Never place objects on the floor where you can trip over them. And don't try to carry too many things at one time. That not only puts your collections at risk, but also your personal health. Lastly, you want to inspect an object before you first pick it up to make sure you understand any special handling it may require. You don't want to drop an object because it's too heavy and you didn't ask for help. Sometimes you may need to support a fragile paper object with a stiff paper so you don't have to actually handle it that much. Remember, your family treasures are often at greatest risk when being handled, and there's a terrible sinking feeling if you pick up an item and damage it. Letters, documents, and other two-dimensional objects can be placed on a flat surface for viewing. But to prevent damage to bound volumes, use cradles so you won't open them further than they can safely withstand. As you gently open a book, at some point you will notice where there is some slight resistance. 
This is the farthest point that you can open the book without risking damage. Cradles should be make sure to uh, cradles should be used to make sure that the book doesn't open beyond this resistance point. And this opening can be different for every book, and even for different page openings within the same book. Do not force books to open flat unless they easily do so. There are commercially available foam cradles, but as an alternative, you can use rolled up clean towels or even soft pillows. Scrapbooks are another special category of collection materials as they tend to be one of a kind objects put together by an individual and contain a wide range of materials, including photographs, newspaper clippings, ephemera, textiles, and even more unusual things like hair. The way that scraps are applied to the support pages can make them fragile or difficult to handle safely. So you should be careful to support the page as you turn it and look underneath to see if there's fragile material on the back of the support. Scrapbooks don't usually open well if the bindings are intact, as both commercial and handmade scrapbooks tend to be held together by metal posts, ribbons, or strings. Given these issues, one handling and protective enclosure strategy for scrapbooks involves disbinding the pages and placing them in folders and a box. Now this should not be done without a lot of thought and planning as you are changing the object and creating other risks, such as the material getting out of order. But this can be an important preservation strategy for scrapbooks and can greatly facilitate handling. Objects on facing pages will no longer wear against each other, and a folder can be flipped over closed to access information on the other side of the page. It can also make it much easier to reformat the object as the scrapbook pages will lie flat and can be handled individually instead of manipulating the entire scrapbook for every image. This leads us right into reformatting which is essentially copying materials in a different format. For preservation, this used to mean microfilming, but the acceptance of electronic capture and delivery of information in the last 20 years has changed the way most reformatting is done. Making multiple copies and distributing them widely is the best way to make sure that information is not lost. New technologies make this easy as digital surrogates can be duplicated and shared with a few clicks. Preservation of the original format is still very important, but for many people who want the information, a reformatted copy is perfectly adequate. And with family treasures, this can also allow you to distribute material to multiple family members when there's only one original. The quality of electronic capture of information has increased at the same time that the cost has decreased, making this an even better strategy. You can also make another physical copy with a photocopier, which can be important for research materials you use frequently to limit handling of the original. Bound volumes should be imaged from above rather than stress the object by repeatedly turning it over face down on a scanner or photocopier. The setup shown here is a professional one, but you can do the same thing with proper lighting and a camera. Even new phones have fairly good cameras for this purpose. If an item is particularly fragile, you may want to consider having a professional reform at it, making sure they are trained in handling fragile collection materials and producing a high quality digital image. Digital records, like physical ones, also require preservation. And this is an area of your personal collections that you might overlook. I'm sure many of you have digital photos, probably thousands. And this will only grow larger in the future. Even some of your ancestry research is now likely stored in a digital form instead of physical notes and reformatting physical items only adds to the digital ones you will need to care for. The item scanned in the last slide is now a digital photograph viewable on a screen. 
Digital preservation starts with identifying what you want to keep long term. The preservation challenge is the change in technology over time, both hardware and software. So you want to migrate or move your information to newer technologies when they are adopted and then distribute copies as possible. Cloud storage and digital storage vendors can be appealing, but proceed with caution. These are usually companies interested in making a profit. They could potentially go out of business and you can lose information without your own backups. So the final subject that I want to discuss today is conservation. I've saved this for last because I think it plays a minimal part in preserving your family treasures and might be one of the last activities that you will focus on. An exception to this is reformatting. The number one reason that items are most often conserved today is in preparation for digitization. This document is a perfect example. It has condition issues that make it difficult to digitize. Limited conservation not only allows for better capture of the information, but also makes the item stable enough to be handled during the reformatting process. Digitization also allows for a more limited approach to conservation. Having a digital surrogate means that the original will not receive as much handling as most researchers can get everything they need from a high quality image. The outside losses of the paper have not been filled as part of the conservation treatment as this won't preserve any original information. When considering conservation, you first need to figure out what you are attempting to do. It often helps to think about why the object is important to you. As an example, I'm showing you my great-grandmother's modern Priscilla cookbook from 1924. I didn't really know my great-grandmother at all as I was only two when she died, but for some reason she liked me and left me this cookbook. It obviously has condition issues but conservation treatment of those issues will not achieve the goals that I have for this volume. All of the wear, stains, the newspaper clippings, and the manuscript notations and additions in this book are evidence of my great-grandmother's use, evidence of her life. If I clean the volume or change it in any way, it will have less of a connection with her. It's very important to keep in mind that you don't have to do conservation work on every object. This evidence of use can be the most important part of the story that a particular object might tell. And conservation treatments can't always be reversed. For instance, if I dry clean this book, there's no magic way to get the dirt back on it. Any conservation treatment will change your object even if the change is minimal. Documentation, written as well as photographic, will help you and future custodians understand the changes that took place. Conservation can involve extensive handling. Any treatment of important items needs to be done by a qualified conservator. And conservation is challenging, so conservators specialize. A painting conservator is not necessarily qualified to treat a photograph. The use of stable and sympathetic materials is extremely important. Pressure sensitive tapes used years ago to repair the break in this uh, photograph and now visible as stains should never be used. And conservation will not replace the need for preservation. It still doesn't take the place of proper handling, storage, and controlling the environment. This is one of the photographs we saw earlier that was rolled fairly tightly. It is possible to humidify and flatten photographs and other paper-based items on your own, but this should be approached with extreme caution. Materials can have issues with moisture, and because they are rolled, there might be more extensive damage than is visible. This photo had several long tears that made handling difficult and required mending. The number one rule of conservation is to do no harm. So I would encourage you to consult a qualified conservator, even for treatments that may seem minimal. 
If you would like to learn more about the flattening process, I've included two websites. The second resource from the Smithsonian National Postal Museum even includes a video of a conservator showing flattening. And the use of high quality materials by a trained professional will not guarantee a successful outcome without a plan that includes the story that object has to tell. The 1847 cloth publisher's binding shown here had a missing spine, so it was rebacked with a high quality gold tooled leather replacement by a highly trained individual. While this might have been the right choice for many books, the printed pattern cloth covering material on this binding is incredibly rare, and the story this book tells is lessened by the treatment choice, especially the use of non-sympathetic materials. The outcome of a more recent conservation treatment can be seen on the right. It included the removal of the inappropriate material and the construction of a new cloth spine toned to match the original cloth while preserving as much of the original binding as possible. The treatment stabilizes the object, allows for present use, and enhances the visual nature as it may be exhibited in the future. If you do seek out conservation treatment, you should make sure that the conservator is a member of the National Professional Organization for Conservators in this country, the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works, also known as AIC. AIC's guidelines for finding a conservator can help you find one in your geographic area who specializes in the types of materials that you need treated. The Northeast Document Conservation Center is a nonprofit organization with a mission of providing preservation information and conservation treatment services. NEDCC has a leaflet that can help you when working with a conservator, guiding you through the questions to ask, what a conservator should be providing you, and how to make sure you have the best outcome from any conservation treatment undertaken. They also have a series of preservations on their website that are free to browse or download. There are 49 leaflets divided into seven broad categories. So if you'd like more information about any of the topics we covered today, this would be a good place to start. Here's a quick wrap up of the most important points that we discussed today. Preservation is about limiting change to your collections, which can best be done with measures that affect the entire collection. Your materials will deteriorate over time, but you can slow this down by controlling the environment and handling items carefully. One of the best things you can do is to make sure you're placing your collections in proper enclosures and make copies when possible to make sure the information will be protected for future use. And if you have questions, talk with a professional. Now here are some immediate goals that you might want to think about for your collections. Number one, move your family treasures out of poor storage areas, especially basements and attics. You should organize your collections to better know what you are trying to preserve. If possible, safely remove any fasteners that will harm your objects like metal paper clips, staples, or rubber bands, which will eventually break down and stick to objects. If you can, start to place materials, especially fragile ones, in correctly sized enclosures made from high quality materials. And you can start to track the environment where your collections are stored. This will help you know to let you know if you need to make changes like lowering the temperature or controlling the humidity. And remember that New England Historic Genealogical Society is here to help. If you just can't seem to make any headway in getting your family collections organized, especially paper-based collections, we do offer a service that you can check out on our website. Thank you very much for your time today. 
Thank you, Todd, for that fantastic presentation. So now let's tackle your questions. If you have anything that you'd like to ask, go ahead and type it into the questions panel, and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time provided, so about in the next 10 minutes. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in, so let's get to it. Um, first of all, Penny asks, should paper items like letters be laminated? That is a great question, Penny, because there's a very simple answer, no. A lamination is almost a permanent treatment to your collections, and without knowing how those plastics are going to age over time, and if I had to guess, I'm going to say that they're going to break down over time and cause worse problems, I would definitely not laminate them. Put them in folders, um, house them in a way that you can easily take them out. Um, that's really the best situation for storing them. Thank you. Uh, now, Diane asks or says, I have many aging framed paper diplomas that take up too much space. Uh, what is the best way to store them without taking up an entire closet? I mean, should they be removed from the frames? Should they be kept in the frames? Um, what do you suggest? Um, hi, Diane. I would say if they don't need to be framed, um, you can certainly take them out of the frames or have a, 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 a framer take them out of the frames carefully for you, and then they can be stored maybe in one uh, enclosure in uh, folders within the enclosure, which is probably a better storage mechanism than a frame. When they're framed, I always worry about the glass breaking. I worry about the off-gassing from the wood if there are wood frames. I worry about the material that might be behind those diplomas. So you can certainly um, take them out of the frames and store them more carefully in a, in a box with folders. Now, Anne asks about uh, the use of plastic storage boxes, you know, thinking about those that are more commercially available, like those made by Rubbermaid and Sterilite. Uh, do you recommend using those to store your collections? Um, hi, Anne. I don't recommend them for long-term storage because if you do have any issues with humidity, um, you're creating a trapped environment that won't allow them to breathe. So you could be placing them in a place that's going to accelerate any mold that might happen. We like materials that breathe a little so that they won't trap anything in there. And then as these materials start to you know, continue their very slow deterioration, they're releasing... Um, off-gassing things, and you, again, would be trapping them with the uh, plastic. So for short-term storage, plastic can be great, but not for long-term storage. Excellent question. And we have a number of questions regarding clothing. Um, so should clothing not be kept on hangers? If they are in dry cleaner, you know, those plastic bags, should they be removed from them? How do you recommend uh, storing and preserving um, clothing items. Well, I am. My specialty is not in textiles, but uh, again, the plastic. Uh, you know, especially a plastic that's just coming from a dry cleaner or something like that. They're they're not concerned with long term storage, so that plastic is probably going to break down quite quickly. If they're hanging on hangers, there is some gravitational pull to the textiles. Um, I think most textile conservators would. Um, urge you or encourage you to put them into blo to boxes, store them flat as much as possible, to not fold them if you can possibly do that, and to use some paper padding if you have to for some three-dimensional objects or something where you need to make sure that it isn't lying completely flat or crushing something while it's sitting there. But definitely plastic should be avoided uh, in almost all cir circumstances. And Diane asks, uh, are cedar chests still recommended? Um, that is a great um, question, Diane. Cedar chests are, are, are fantastic if you're just trying to prevent moths from eating your textiles. 
Otherwise, they're not a good strategy at all. The strong smell that you get from a cedar chest is off-gassing, and those chemicals that it's off-gassing will be harming um, your materials, um, particularly anything that's made out of cellulose, so paper, um, most older textiles. So cedar is not recommended. It has that one advantage that people always talk about, but it has other disadvantages that really um, – make it not a good storage environment. And Jamie asks about um, those albums, those photo albums that we probably all have in our collection from the 70s and 80s. They were, I think, called the magnetic uh, albums. How do you recommend um, moving forward with that? Do you take out the photographs? Do you do something else? What do you recommend? Um, hi, Jamie. Uh, since I have uh, a couple of photo albums like that myself, um, the first thing that I would do would be to document the photograph album the way it is. So make sure you take a, as high a quality picture of each page as you can. There, there might be writing on the support pages. You want to know the, um, the order of things, the placement of things, because sometimes that's a very personal thing for whoever put it together. Then the, the object should be removed from that. Those are, they're actually a pressure sensitive support page. They have little strips of pressure sensitive adhesive that uh, tend to break down over time. You might notice some yellowing to, to those pages, particularly around the edges where air has gotten in. Um, so if you can get those removed, um, if you can remove them yourself, uh, that's probably not a bad idea. Again, doing this documentation beforehand, um, if you have issues with that, then I would seek out a uh, photo conservator um, to, to work on those. And Scott asks, are there guidelines for when you should switch from using a folder to an enclosure for kind of a non-paper item? For example, say you have um, more or less flat awards or medals, Sh can't, and they could fit in a folder, um, but, uh, you know, is there possible damage that could be done if you leave something like that in a folder? Should it go into a box? What guidelines might there be? Um, hi, Scott. I think that um, you're on the right track here. If you're getting pressure on top of something, um, especially if there's another um, document or letter or something that you're concerned about and it's on top of a slightly three-dimensional object and there's pressure, then you can get damage or indentations caused from that. Um, one of the things that you can do you know, I always like to store folders inside boxes if I can because a, a folder is a it's a great way to separate objects and to protect them somewhat, but not as much protection as box. You can also create sinks or um, kind of mats for objects that have uh, seals or metals or ribbons or things like that so that there's an area that um, the, the sink protects so that uh, you have a cutout, basically, that allows for that to be on its own. But if other materials are placed on top, it's supported by that mat or that um, that uh, other material that you've then cut out to protect it. So it is something to, to be uh, careful with. And we're getting a lot of questions about old uh, photo albums with the heavy black paper. Um, we probably, again, all have something like that in our collections. Do you recommend removing the photographs from those pages, um, keeping them as is, maybe putting the entire album into an enclosure? What do you suggest there? First, I think it's always great to um, to. Uh, put an enclosure on an object like that. And we do have to remember it's an object. So we might not like all of the internal factors in some of the objects that we have, but we have to think of it as an object first, and anything that you do is going to change that object. Again, taking it out of its own time period and placing it in our time period. So if the black paper is not disintegrating, if it's not becoming brittle, it might not be as big of an issue, especially if you don't have to handle it much. If there is room in the album, you might be able to take a very thin, acid-free buffered paper, which has passed the photoactivity test, and put it in between each 
uh, one of the pages so that it's getting some type of benefit to those other pages. I would say if, it, if there's not a problem, then just protect it the way it is with a box. If there is a problem, then you need to work out a plan on how to, uh, to work on that. Um, but first, you know, just protect it with a box unless you have to do something else. And another situation um, from one listener who says, you know, I've started storing a few photographs inside an acid-free folder. Should buffered or is it non-buffered paper be used to separate those few photos within the folder? Um, that's a good question. Uh, photo conservators always used to say that if you were having a piece of paper in contact, with a photograph, it should be a pH neutral, unbuffered paper. They've since found with a lot of testing that that's not necessarily as important as they once thought. For certain types of photographs, it is, you know, cyanotype, which is a blue type of photograph, um, very popular around the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. That does not want to have buffered paper. But more important than whether the paper is um, Neutral or buffered is you want to make sure it passes the photoactivity test, which means that they've done all this testing to see how that particular paper is going to affect your photograph. So that's what you want to look for, PAT approved paper. All right, we're just about out of time, but maybe just two more quick questions. Um, a few people have asked about the material in gloves, I mean, can you use nylon or silk gloves? Um, maybe answer that one first, and I'll come to the final question in a moment. Well, the issue with gloves is really, do they fit closely? So the reason that we recommend nitrile or latex gloves is because they fit so closely to your hand that you feel the object really well when you handle it. If you have a different type of material, even you know nylon, silk, the concern is that your fingers don't fit very well, that you can't feel through that material, and that something bad will happen because you don't you can't feel that something bad is happening. And again, for most things, um, unless you have these you know very sensitive materials like photographs or um, metals, and it's only some photographs, then you would um, just need to wash your hands really well and you'll be fine. And final question for today, uh, Robert asks, should storage boxes lay flat or vertically? Well, very important, Robert, the last question of the day. Um, it depends. Uh, the more often you can store things flat, the better. Now, certain objects like books have historically been stored upright, and as long as they're not fragile um, in a box, they can also be stored upright. So think about the fragility of the object, what potentially will happen to it over time. Um, so flat storage is great, but it's not always possible. So again, it, it, uh, it does kind of depend, but I would lean towards flat storage if you can do it. All right. Well, thank you again, Todd. Great presentation. Um, we had a few questions about um, if we could repeat the websites and the URLs that we included in the presentation. I will include those in a follow-up email that you should receive from me later today. So if you did miss uh, some of those links, don't worry. You will have them um, later today. Before we wrap up today, I do want to let you know about two upcoming programs that you may be interested in. The first one is coming up this Saturday, January 19th. We are holding an online conference on organizing your family history, expert strategies from start to finish. So we'll go over organizing your research, your research, uh, both physical and electronic notes, how to organize your materials for publication, and finally, how to organize your family treasures for future generations or for donation to a local repository. Also in July of this year, we will be holding a four-day workshop here at our library and archives in Boston in which you can bring a portion of your collection from home and we will provide hands-on assistance um, to help you organize, uh, process, and really preserve your collection. 
I will uh, also be providing links to both of those events in my follow-up email, but you can also learn more by going to our website, AmericanAncestors.org. So thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings. Any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org slash education. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.